first of all, thank you, Dr. Mace. I appreciate the uh, empirical uh, dive down. It's extremely helpful. And, uh, and, um, and I have a little, speaking of uh, no school, I have a little, a little, a little no, son who's coming in out of the distance. No, no, sorry, you can't go. Yeah. I need to ask a few questions. What's that? Just wait. Okay, so you, you just note, made uh, Linda's point. <laughs> oh, God. Well, uh, you know, we don't need to go too far into that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, I appreciate what you're saying about like what school facilities can be used because th that conversation I know with the, with the educational institutions, it's, it's, it's like, okay, so we have camps and childcare open, but school, which is the primary location, and we have outdoor and we have, I, you know, how does that, I think that's a larger question for the schools and us, obviously, is how those facilities and how those, those folks can help because basically there's no, uh, there's no workforce without, uh, uh, without school as well. So I won't get too far into that. I, ha I do have a couple questions for you. One of the things that um, for people who have been intubated, uh, there's, there's a lot of discussion about how, how impactful that is for your health going forward. Uh, what's the, uh, how, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can have irreversible damage to your lungs if you're in, intubated, especially if you're getting high levels of oxygen. And uh, once intubated, you know, people are having a really, really tough time coming off ventilators. In fact, the mortality is quite high. Even um, our uh, treatments like the remdesivir that we're giving to acutely ill people may not be so effective once somebody is actually intubated. We are seeing a plasma a potential positive impact of using plasma up front. I know that our um, doctors at Sutter, Dr. Green, is doing that. And so um, once recovered and off a of ventilator, it's going to be a process of rehabilitation, pulmonary and just general rehabilitation. Okay. So it's going to be hard to say really what the long-term impacts are. Mm -hmm. We do know from other diseases that it takes a long time to recover from the hospital being the ICU, being intubated, and people may not get back to 100% lung capacity. So these are just things that we're going to see over time. How much does COVID impact quality of life in the future? Thank you. Um, I want to go back to the, the, the discussion of skilled nursing facilities slash post-acute and then assisted senior living and board and care. And um, can you go through, uh, from your understanding, who... Talk about who are the individuals in each of those different areas. Because we, it seems like, so you used the word 16 out of 22 deaths were at SNPs, skilled nursing facilities. Are you using that to say SNPs, post-acute, assisted, senior, and board and care, all of those are 16 or just the SNPs? And if you can, just help me understand uh, how those like five different designations, who's kind of, who are the, who are the individuals who are in those, in, the, in, in those different care facilities? And so skilled nursing facility and post-acute is similar, meaning that you were in the hospital and then maybe you need, couldn't quite go back to your home environment or maybe never would again because of whatever your illness was, you may go to a skilled nursing facility, which is a patient care facility. Post-acute, you know, people can go there for rehabilitation after hip surgery, you know, things like that. But you also have people who are just chronically living in the skilled nursing facility because they are at a level of care patient care where they need 24 seven nursing care. So those are really sick people. And that is where our deaths have been, as you pointed out. Now residential care facilities for the elderly, assisted living, independent living, these places are different. They're board and care facilities where people are living, but they, it's not patient care facility. So you don't have 24 seven care. Um, and they have different levels of care. So independent living is like apartments for older folks. There's really no medical care happening there. Um, you know, you are pretty much just living as if you would in an apartment, except you're in a, a facility that caters specifically to older adults. And there may be a gym, there may be a dining hall where they serve food, where you pay for food, but you get food there and that kind of thing. So um, assisted living is where you need a little bit more assistance. Maybe you need a daytime nurse or something like that, a caregiver, not a nurse, that comes in and the assisted living facilities might provide that. 
uh, residential care facilities cover all those and board and care homes. So they're kind of interchangeable, but the key difference is a skilled nursing facility or post-acute is a patient care facility, and the others are simply board and care homes and facilities that might provide different levels of services, but not patient care. And when you said, and when you said that 16 out of our 22 deaths are from SNPs, you do mean skilled yeah, nursing, nursing facilities, facilities, patient care facilities. Yes. And these are the most vulnerable people in our in our society by exactly. and large, not yes. just for COVID, but in, by and large. Is that correct? Everything. Yes. Okay. Well, I can see how difficult it is to try and figure out. They're they're regulated by the state. They're private facilities by and large, right? Mm -hmm. uh, paid for either with medical reimbursements or and or with investment from individuals. And and then, as you say, is is that you have this uh, this potential two week plus incubation period before. So you could be doing temperature checks on those employees. You could be doing wellness checks on every one of them coming in, and three out of ten of them uh, would slip in no matter what, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, They're asymptomatic, and you know, it doesn't matter how much screening you do. And now, what you could say is most of them have a contact to a case outside of their work, like a family member or. Um, you know, some kind of a, they're not really community transmission cases as much yet. So we may have already identified them as a contact, but they, before they're identified as a contact, they're working, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it makes you wonder how that's going to be managed over the course of the next, uh, you know, this coming six months to a year, because that's pretty much, that's, that's very similar in other communities with the, with the high death rates coming out of the skilled nursing facilities. So, yeah. um, it's going to continue to be there and it's it's a strange one too because most of the um there's an undercurrent of what we hear from the people who are saying that the the haters on covid like covid's not that serious and it always comes to this point of like it's not serious for a lot of us is what they kind of are trying to say um and it's a weird it's a weird line of thought because i always say well you know their rights somebody's rights who are and the most vulnerable are as important as somebody's rights who are, you know, as strong as anything. But um, but th this weird discussion keeps coming up from our constituents and from other people, which is which is a different one, which you know, I don't support. But how do you respond to people who say, you know, we should be focusing on the the uh, the folks who are the most vulnerable and not on everybody, not shutting things down for everybody. Well, um, I think we are seeing some real negative outcomes in younger folks, too. I okay. mean, we did have, uh, you know, not in our county, but somebody who worked in our county was 40 who actually ha died. And if you look at the news and you look at uh, the national numbers, there are actually a significant number of really poor outcome strokes in younger people, Kawasaki syndrome, yeah, kids. You know, and we don't really know what the long-term consequences of having had coronavirus mm -hmm. are, because it could very well be, um, you know, that different, um, there could be longer term effects on different systems, um, the respiratory, cardiac, whatever it is. So we are seeing some evidence that uh, COVID could affect, uh, you know, many, many of our systems and the people may not fully recover. We, this all, it's a novel coronavirus. So we'll know more in the coming uh, few years, I think, about that. But I would say- We'll know more when it's not We want to protect our vulnerable populations, but we just want to try to minimize transmission of COVID generally in the community. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, very, that, that's a valid point. It seems to me that one of, and maybe you can, you can share this a little bit, is, is that as much as what we talk about that's known about COVID, we, there's so much more that's unknown even for somebody at your level of, of study and all these epidemiologists, I continue to hear people talk about how we still don't know and we still see things. So um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you, you, you sharing that. I do have one, one final question, which is um, you and I have talked a little bit about how uh, antibody tests, right? How um, even though our test is 98% so-called accurate, uh, that 98% is dependent upon how much of your population has been tested. I believe you said like it, less than 1% have tested positive, even though it's 98%, you could get down to like a 50% positive or negative rate. Talk, talk to us a little bit about our antibody testing and, um, and, and what, what we're seeing with 
positives, what we're seeing, I'm not looking for your 2.5% of all these numbers, but how, how, what's the veracity level of where you're at and where we're going on things? So, so the less COVID there is in the community, the more likelihood that you'll have the false positive results. So if truly less than 1% of the community is, uh, has been infected ever with COVID, and even though that test has the ability to, to detect people who are positive of 97.3%, if you do the calculations, you get a lot of 50% of the positives will be false positives. That's the way it works out, which is why we started off with the antibody testing in high risk individuals, healthcare workers or first responders where they had cases. In those groups, we have a much higher percentage of antibody uh, test positivity. In one of our healthcare facilities, it's as high as 7% of people that were tested as staff members had antibodies, even though we, we had cases, but not nearly that many, suggesting there was a lot more spread there. So in that group, the antibody test would be much more believable because the likelihood we got infected is much higher, right? So um, what I would say is we're not at a place right now where we really should be testing uh, general community members who have had no exposure and have no risk for COVID with the antibody test. We might be there in October where we have more community transmission and we want to find that out. But for now, I, you know, we've done our 5,000 antibody tests and we'll be presenting all that data to you shortly. And what we found by different sectors, different um, you know, law, fire, healthcare workers, different types of healthcare workers, hospital workers, skilled nursing facilities, this kind of thing, we can break it all down. What we do know is of our cases, not 90% plus are positive on antibody tests. Meaning they had their actual cases. They were positive on the PCR test. You'd expect 100% of them to be positive. About 90, 90 to 95% are. Going back uh, quickly, uh, to just to clear up any confusion, I did look at our uh, data of the 16 deaths, 12 were from patient care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, post-acute, four actually from our CFEs, residential care facilities for the elderly, they are not patient care, but they have all the same uh, challenges in, in, in terms of vulnerable populations. So four are actually from, one I think from an assisted living center actually. Good, thank you so much, I appreciate it. It's all for me. Uh, the state is monitoring five different uh, criteria. criteria. Um, first of all, our testing, the ability to test, um, and we are fine there. We have had an average of 178 tests per day uh, over the last seven days. Um, and there's a seven-day lag for the state, but this hasn't really changed for us. Our case rate is of concern, still being over 100 per 100,000. We're actually at 152.5 per 100,000 over the past 14 days on average. Our test positivity is creeping up. It was uh, about 2.5 to 3.5 percent, but as you can see, over the last uh, seven-day average, it's 5.9 percent. Um, and our hospitalizations have been increasing, as you know. The change in three-day percentage that the state has is 19 percent, so we're above the threshold of 10 percent. And our uh, ICU bed capacity, which we briefly touched upon. And the previous board item is less than uh, 20%. We have less than 20% of ICU beds available. We're currently at 10.4% of ICU bed availability. We're doing fine in terms of our ventilator uh, availability at this time. And our data pretty much tracks this. It's a little bit more up to date as there's a lag in reporting to the state of California. This uh, has us remain on the watch or monitoring list for the state. So effective uh, July 13th, about two weeks ago, um, that is 10 days ago, uh, the California Department of Public Health placed new restrictions on us because we were on the watch list and we had been on the watch list for three days. And uh, that required the following industries to shut down unless they could be legally modified to operate outside or by curbside pickup that applied to dining restaurants, wineries and tasting rooms, movie theaters, family entertainment centers, zoos and museums, card rooms, gyms and fitness centers, places of worship and cultural ceremonies like weddings and funerals, 
offices for non-essential sectors, non-critical infrastructure, personal care services that include things like nail salons and uh, tattoo parlors, massage parlors, shopping malls, and hair salons and barbershops. These restrictions will remain in place until the state takes further action. These are uh, shut down per state order, not our local county health order at this time. You need to come off the watch list for a period of 14 days in order for us to be considered um, for um, loosening these restrictions. Our case rate, as you can see, has been inching upwards. Um, about a month ago, we were at a case rate of uh, 55 per 100,000. Uh, that was up from 20 per 100,000 in early June. And now we're uh, kind of pretty much averaging at a case rate of about 150 per 100,000, which puts us 50 per 100,000 above the state's uh, threshold or benchmark. If you look at the source of infection by report week, you can see early on in the pandemic, we had a lot of cases occurring due to travel, which is the uh, sort of uh, red or brick color here. And uh, we had uh, many cases occurring in close contacts, not as many due to community transmission until more recently when we have seen more cases occurring in people that just pop up in the community with no reason to have COVID. In other words, they have no known exposure, no known travel or other risk factor that would put them at risk for COVID. So community transmission is definitely up in the past month. We see that we also have a lot of cases occurring in close contacts. This is good because we are actually identifying those close contacts contacts, prioritizing them for testing, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, and then getting them on isolation or quarantine, depending on whether they're a case or not. Uh, it's not good because there's a lot of transmission occurring in households, work sites, and other sectors uh, of COVID. COVID transmission is ongoing because contacts to COVID cases are largely getting COVID. Now you can see that the travel-related cases have also increased substantially um, in the last month because our travel restrictions are no longer in effect. People are traveling domestically from county to county, from state uh, to state as well. We're not seeing international travel contributing to this, but domestic travel, uh, both in-state and out-of-state, we are seeing. Now, of note, the last two weeks, we have a lot of cases that are still under investigation. So in all likelihood, these under investigation cases will go into the categories of contacts, community transmission and travel. So uh, we will continue to see, I believe this increased trend in community transmission as these people under uh, still investigation get figured out, we'll see the travel increasing and we'll see close contacts remaining uh, probably about the same or increasing over time. So of uh, the 849 cases that we've had reported in the last three weeks, 611 have been evaluated for exposure. That's 72%. Of these 611, uh, the majority are closed contacts, but you can see community acquired cases are increasing. And this again will likely increase even further over time as we have community transmission. 7% are now due to travel and that's significantly more than it was two months ago. If you look at the modes of transmission amongst close contacts specifically, so amongst those cases that are due to close contact, 47% had household contact. So still we're seeing a lot of transmission of COVID in, in households. 18% became infected at their workplace. And this is significantly greater than what we were seeing before. Before, uh, when I presented this, I said less than 10% of cases were due to workplace exposure. This is increasing, suggesting that we are having more uh, clusters or more outbreaks in work sites. 6% had both workplace and household exposure. 14% were exposed in congregate care, meaning uh, this is our skilled nursing facilities and residential care facilities for the elderly assisted and independent living uh, facilities, as well as congregate settings like um, the um, uh, juvenile hall or, um, or jail. 14%, and this is of note and very important to note, were exposed to COVID-19 at gatherings. For example, family and friend gatherings, 4th of July barbecues, Father's Days, birthday parties, bridal showers, funerals, et cetera. 
And that is very important to know because this is a place where we can definitely make an impact by having people not attend gatherings unless they're your own household members. Um, even extended family gatherings have led to cases. Uh, definitely gatherings of friends uh, have led to cases. It's because you basically are exposed to everyone and anyone that the people that you're gathering with are exposed to. So if you were, say, to get together with your neighbors and your neighbors go to gyms or restaurants or bars or whatever personal care services in the past month when they were still open, then you are basically exposed to everybody that your neighbors would have been exposed to as well. So what about our um, modes uh, for the community transmission cases, of which there were 96? 60% uh, had no known exposure that we could elicit. Again, we are asking about where people had been in the last two weeks. And 60% of our cases did not mention grocery stores, gatherings, or specific events, you know, visiting uh, bars, gyms, restaurants, parks, et cetera. However, it's, they got it from somewhere. So it must have been some exposure that they couldn't remember or pinpoint. Of the 40 cases who list some exposure, you can see that a, um, about um, um, a little bit more than a quarter, about a third of them listed gatherings again. So this is why, again, want to underline, we need to ensure that, that people are not gathering with non-household members. 11 listed necessary activities, grocery stores, healthcare visits, banks, gas stations. Nine were probable or possible workplace or household exposures that are unconfirmed. Five did mention restaurants, bars, or salons, and one was a homeless individual. So this is community transmission, meaning we had, uh, there was no known exposure. Like we didn't know, for example, that they were in contact to a case or uh, they were, they had traveled to somewhere where there is more COVID. Now through travel, you can see that 30 cases of the 45 that um, had transmission uh, through travel, reported travel outside of California. Air travel, driving outside state for vacations to visit family, attend funerals and other gathering. So again, you see that the denominator keeps coming back to gatherings. Gatherings amongst close contacts, gatherings amongst community transmission cases, and gatherings amongst people who traveled. 15 cases reported travel within California. Work in other counties was a primary reason for travel, followed by visiting family but extended family, again, not your household members. Ride sharing without use of facial coverings when traveling with non-household members was definitely identified as a possible contributing factor to infection in cases involving transportation within the county as well as travel outside the county, meaning that people who go to work together, for example, who don't live together, but they work together, but they travel together in vans, that kind of thing. So if you look at the, uh, we, we've gotten a question of how many of our cases are asymptomatic versus cases that are symptomatic. And you can see that um, by age group, um, we do have up to 42, 40, 42, 43% of our cases uh, being asymptomatic, especially in the kids. And we know that, we know that to be true, that children are less likely to be symptomatic. And then you can also see in the older uh, group of over age 65, you also see more asymptomatic individuals. So this is why we have a mitigation factor of facial coverings, so that you will protect others if you are an asymptomatic case to prevent transmission of COVID to others when you don't know that you have COVID. So this is um, mirroring some data that we've seen in other studies in other parts of the country and the world. So, uh, pretty high percentage of our cases are actually asymptomatic. And uh, we can get at this 20% altogether of Sonoma County cases have been asymptomatic. Again, in some categories, much higher than 20%, kids and the older, uh, older adults. Oops, just, okay, so you can see um, also uh, by looking at asymptomatic versus symptomatic uh, individuals that it's pretty much uh, 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 equal parts male and female. So gender has no impact on whether someone is asymptomatic or uh, symptomatic. In other words, equal par parts male and female. You can see our close contacts are much more likely 
to be asymptomatic. And the reason for that, of course, is because we're testing all contacts, whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic. So it makes total sense that we'd be have a much higher proportion of um, close contacts being asymptomatic than other groups. Um, but you can see that even within community transmission cases, travel uh, cases, et cetera, we do have a percentage that are asymptomatic, and that's important to note. Uh, this just means that if we do much more widespread testing, we may find more and more asymptomatic people with COVID because when we do test in close contacts, we find a lot. Um, and in terms of being active versus recover, there's really not much of a difference uh, between um, asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals. So looking at industries that actually have documented workplace transmission, services and sales are right up there. And we did open these uh, workplaces about six weeks ago. Um, first for curbside and pickup maybe two months ago, and then for actual uh, indoor services, in other words, uh, retail services. And we do have, um, of the cases that were due to workplace transmission, 37 cases in that group. Healthcare is high on the list. We've, ha we've had outbreaks in healthcare facilities, construction and landscaping, which actually has been open all along. I want to remind people that construction was one of the things that was considered essential from day one, and therefore, and landscaping shortly thereafter followed. So we have a lot of cases in that. Agriculture, we have a good number of cases. Public safety, this would be law enforcement, fire. We know we've had some outbreaks in those groups. Manufacturing and in food production. Those are the workplaces, not where people worked, but they were cases, but where actual workplace transmission occurred. Uh, we had a request for COVID cases by zip, zip code area. And our epidemiologists have been able to produce that data. You can see still our urban center, Santa Rosa, Petaluma, have the most cases with Santa Rosa having nearly half our cases in the following associated zip codes. Uh, Petaluma, again, following Santa Rosa and the following zip codes. Sonoma Valley, uh, then third with the following zip codes and so on and so forth. You can see that um, Sumo Valley, Katati Rona Park, Windsor Healdsburg are about the same in terms of the percentage of cases uh, with Cloverdale, uh, Sebastopol, Russian River, area, River area and others being uh, much, much less likely to have cases. So our urban centers, like we're finding everywhere where there's a lot more commingling of people and a lot more crowding is where we're having our cases. And that's where more people are living as well. Cumulative cases are increasing in every age category, as you can see. But of note, just like the na national trend, it's actually the people, um, the young adults, uh, or adults, uh, largely middle-aged adults, in which we're really seeing a lot more increasing cases. And that's because they're probably out and about a lot more uh, engaging in all kinds of activities than our older adults. And that's really reassuring because we are seeing an increase, obviously, in older adults, but not nearly as much as in the younger people, because you know the outcomes are much poorer in those who are older. So anyways, this, it's, uh, the takeaway really is cases are increasing in every single age group, but disproportionately so in uh, younger and middle-aged adults. By age group, this just confirms what I just said. The majority of our cases are occurring in uh, the sort of 18 to 54 age group with a majority in the 25 to 34 age group, less than the older adults who we've really told to continue sheltering in place and stay at home and not to be involved in a lot of activities outside of the home. And uh, very few cases in uh, the young, very young, but a good proportion of cases in our children that is important to note as well. And these are because they're often contacts in households. That's where the majority of our child cases are coming from. Our testing capacity has been really good. Our average daily testing volume has been 879 tests per day, which is really fantastic because our goal was to be able to do about 750 tests a day. And our current capacity is to do eight to 900 and we're continuing to scale that. Optum's for serve has been very helpful in boosting our testing. In fact, it's only after uh, OptumServe really came about that we were able to meet these numbers.
Um, granted, it's harder to get an appointment now with OptumServe with a week, uh, sometimes a week and a half delay and also a delay in resulting. So again, if people are symptomatic and worried they may actually have COVID based on symptoms, they should really go see their own doctors at this time to get testing right away rather than wait for appointments through OptumServe. However, if you're healthy and uh, don't have any symptoms and want to know your test status, OptumServe is a perfectly good way to get a test result. And OptumServe is now offering about 600 plus appointments a day in Santa Rosa and in Petaluma. Um, here's a number of tests conducted and processed by lab or ordering facility. Kaiser is doing uh, about a quarter of our tests, 22.5%. Uh, OptumServe about 20% or a fifth of our tests. UCSF had, uh, the public health lab through UCSF did a lot of tests. We are no longer using UCSF as one of our laboratories. Quest, not OptumServe, but Quest um, Lab is doing about 13% of our tests, usually through the private providers and the health centers, some hospitals as well. So a public health lab is doing nearly as many tests as Quest. Sutter is doing about 8% of tests, Memorial 5%, LabCorp a much smaller percentage. And you can see the other really represents um, other laboratories uh, that are testing and uh, some other facilities. But you can see that our average turnaround time has gotten much worse in the past month. We're comparing um, uh, July, the week starting July 6th with the week starting June 8th, you see that Kaiser and our own Sonoma County Public Health Lab had a less than one day turnaround time uh, of our test results back in June, but now are up to three days or 72 hours for turnaround time. You can see that OptumServe has gone from a four day turnaround time in June to seven days now. LabCorp, again, from 3.5 to 5.3 days. We're not really using UCSF at this point. Uh, but Quest is uh, particularly more concerning. Not Optum's uh, serve Quest Lab has gone from four days to nine days for turnaround time in tests. And this just reflects the increasing number of tests that Quest is performing nationally. This is a national problem and a state problem. It's not simply a county problem. Um, you can see that Memorial and Sutter still have really good turnaround times, but they're not doing nearly as much testing as these other laboratories and facilities. Uh, positivity by lab or ordering facility, you can see that the public health lab has the greatest positive percentage, and, and that should be because we're the ones who are actually testing the priority patients, the ones that are most likely to have COVID, our contacts, our ill hospitalized, our first responders, healthcare workers, uh, symptomatic vulnerable populations, the skilled nursing facility group, et cetera. However, um, you can see that Kaiser also has uh, close to 4% positivity. Quest having a 4% positivity is actually a concern because this is a lot of the community that's being tested, uh, but they're the symptomatic ones tested because they go to their doctor. Now, LHI or Optimum. Serve. These are largely asymptomatic individuals that want to know their test status is much lower at 1%, which suggests that in the community at large that are asymptomatic, we still probably have about a 1% or less positivity rate, which is really good. And that's what our antibody testing results have been mirroring for the high risk populations. And uh, if we were to do antibody testing for the general community, which we do plan to do in a few months, we would probably see uh, today about 1% or less positivity. And you can see um, Memorial has a, a higher positivity rate of 4%, Sutter 2.5%, etc. So what are some of our challenges and our response? Uh, as you can see, we're again facing limited testing supplies and reagents. Um, and this is a nationwide challenge, again, as uh, testing supplies from a central source are limited because of the demand. Um, it's just a supply dem demand issue. Testing slots available, of which there are 600 a day, are not meeting the public demand, which is why it's taking a week to a week and a half to get an appointment with OptumServe. And then the increased turnaround time delays between testing and results. Um, 
and that directly leads to contact tracing delays, delays in isolation of cases, quarantine and testing of contacts, which means it's gonna only lead to more transmission in our county because of these delays. But these are again, systemic nationwide problems. They are not specific to Sonoma County. They're largely beyond our control because they're due to the um, resource limitations and testing turnaround time capacity in labs. But we are doing several things here in Sonoma County to try to mitigate these, these problems. One is to go to 24 seven staffing of our public health lab so that we can run a lot more tests in the 24 hour period. Right now our lab is really open during the day time hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and lab staff often stay till 7 or 8 p.m. to complete their testing. But we're not open 24 hours. We're trying in, um, to staff the lab so we can be. That way we can double the testing capacity at our public health lab, improve the turnaround times, and ensure that all of our priority testing can be done through the public health lab. We're planning to, once the lab capacity is up to 24 seven, and doubles capacity can take more tests, we'll once again open Sinead drive through PCR testing. I see that happening in the next two weeks. And uh, we are prioritizing high risk groups and close contacts to be tested through our lab. As you can see, the testing positivity is higher, our turnaround times are lower, and we're requesting additional state support for our testing supplies, reagents, and uh, improving turnaround times through option serve. Moving to our COVID-19 hospitalizations, our hospitalizations have surpassed the state um, benchmark of no more than 20 uh, hospitalized patients per day, and the rates continue to trend upwards. Our total cases you can see are um, in the purple, confirmed cases in the blue, suspected cases in the light blue, dark blue and light blue. Um, and so you can see I mean, hospitalization is just adding these two gives us the purple line. And they have increased significantly since mid-June. And the reason for that is uh, our cases in largely in the vulnerable populations, like our skilled nursing facilities, residential care facilities for the elderly, and our assisted living, independent living facilities. That's what it really is contributing and driving up the hospitalizations. The number of staffed ICU beds available has been decreasing, has been um, sort of steadily somewhere between five and 10 here in the first part of uh, July. So uh, again, this is not, doesn't include our surge capacity. We do have 30% surge capacity, but this is also worrisome that our ICU beds are decreasing. And these are not ICU beds that are uh, largely taken up by COVID patients, but non-COVID ill patients. So if you look at our ever hospitalized, now we have 120 ever hospitalized. Uh, you can see that um, uh, we, they're largely occurring in older persons uh, from 18 to 65, equally, equally split really between 18 to 49 and 50 to 64, but greater as you would expect in our over 65 year age group. And evenly split male and female and have largely recovered uh, that's almost two thirds and uh, almost one third are active. And we have had at the time of the slide um, amongst the hospitalized uh, 11 deaths, 9%. But we have had more deaths that have occurred in non hospitalized persons. Of these, 40% were ever in the ICU. If you look at the length of hospital stay by level of care, looking in hospitalized patient, patients who've been discharged as of July 20th of 81, that is, you can see the length of stay for non-ICU patients has been zero to 28 days. The range, the median number of days is five days, but once hospitalized in the ICU, people can be in the hospital much longer. Zero to 46 days is the range with 10 days being sort of the average uh, uh, stay. And um, again, the age, the median age of hospitalized patients is 51 and for ICU patients, uh, 56, as you can see here. Looking at our fatalities, as of July 22nd, yesterday we had 22 uh, residents that died from COVID. And you can see that 
since sort of mid-June, we've seen a huge spike in the deaths. And again, this is largely because we have COVID in our elderly um, congregate living situation uh, patients who are much more likely to have uh, really devastating negative outcomes like death. Looking at the characteristics of those people who died in our county, um, and you know, our hearts go out to the families. Um, half were hospitalized, half were not. 16, that's nearly three quarters, were residents of skilled nursing facilities or residential care homes for the elderly. You can see that we had two hospitalizations in the 50 to 64 uh, year age group, but the majority 20 in over 65. And it's again, equally split um, between um, male and female in terms of the deaths. And uh, the majority had underlying conditions, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, hypertension, other underlying conditions. But about 30%, it's unknown what their underlying conditions were. So this is important to note um, that this is a group that's most direly affected by COVID. And we are no different than anywhere else that's experiencing deaths in terms of COVID, um, in terms of age and other demographic factors and, and underlying factors, medical conditions. Again, our skilled nursing and residential care outbreaks are a great concern right now. COVID-19 cases have included 143 residents and 89 staff in skilled nursing facilities and residential senior care homes uh, since March 1st. The majority of these cases have occurred this month, this last month. Uh, you can see that we've had 89 staff who have turned up positive. This is the way that COVID is going into the skilled nursing facilities and residential care facilities. It's through staff employees that go to work because, and when they don't know that they have COVID and they're asymptomatic or that they're contacts of other staff members or that um, they should be quarantining and they've gone to work or they're mildly symptomatic with something and they don't realize and they end up going to work. 63 staff in the skilled nursing facilities and 26 in assisted or uh, senior living board and care homes. About 143 residents, 99 in skilled nursing facilities and post-acute, and 44 in the assisted senior living board and care. 16 of our deaths are from this group. And um, you can see that uh, the majority of our cases in both staff members and residents are occurring in skilled nursing facilities and in the board in the post-acute uh, setting versus board and care homes. So uh, we've had the 16 deaths in skilled nursing facility residents. Our immediate priorities are to designate a COVID positive SNF. In other words, a facility where we can transfer all individuals who are positive as soon as they're positive. And staffing has been a really big issue because as staff members get ill, they're no longer able to work in these settings and the settings facilities are far understaffed as a result and looking for more staffing. So we are uh, making some progress in designating a positive skilled nursing facility would hopefully have this in place as soon as we can get a contract in place. Um, we also need to designate a place to quarantine exposed or suspected persons because right now they are being housed together and they really should be individually in single um, rooms with, with bathroom. And we're seeking regional and state support to implement this in addition to the resources we have here in the county. Moving to the disproportionate number of COVID cases in the Latinx community, again, the disparity that we've seen, um, which really, uh, you know, we're trying to address in the best way we can by pop-up testing. And that, of course, leads to even more cases in the Latinx, but trying to isolate quar cases, quarantine contacts, test contacts, perform contact tracing. You can see that cases in the Latinx are younger because they are the ones who've been in the essential workforce working from day one more often due to contact transmission, especially in workplace uh, and households, large households, more often are asymptomatic because they're more often to be contacts and less likely to have an underlying condition or be hospitalized because they're younger. So currently we have 67% of our cases occurring in the Hispanic or Latino self-described group and they make up 27% of our population. Whereas in the white non-Hispanic self-described groups one quarter of our cases are happening in that group where 65% are 
of the population is made up of, of uh, this group. And we've had 4% uh, in other non-Hispanic cases and Asian Pacific Islanders, 3%. So again, a terrible disproportionate disparity in the Latinx, uh, probably again, nine or 10 times the case rate in the Hispanic or Latino groups. And you can see that this disparity uh, is uh, seen in um, all age groups. If you put all age groups together, the cumulative case count is significantly higher in those who are in the Latinx groups. This is true in the children because they are often household contacts. This is true in the 18 to 24 year old, the 25 to 34 year old category, the 35 to 44 year old category. But that's where we start stop seeing the disparity from the Latinx. Again, it's people who have been out working in essential businesses, agricultural, farm working, food and beverage, um, janitorial. Um, these are the areas where we've been seeing cases. Now, when you go into the older age groups, in, in, they were less likely to have COVID in the Latinx group, but now, now that shelter in place is largely over and we've opened um, in late May, mid-May, you could see that uh, the Latinx community cases are catching up to the non-Latino cases in this age group. And still in the older population, we don't see as many cases in the Latinx as uh, in uh, comparison with the non-Latino population. That's because this age group is, ever since shelter in place was lifted, is much more out performing activities and going to different places. And then again, in the um, uh, 65 year or older group, we have a huge steep increase in the non-Latino and it is definitely driven by the outbreaks in these groups that we've already been talking about. Not as many cases in the Latinx group in this age group. Again, the employment sectors, uh, this is not where the workplace transmission is necessarily happening, but about 15% of transmission is occurring in the workplace. It's up from 10% last week. That was up from 5% a few weeks ago. So more workplace transmission is occurring. You can see that uh, the Latinx cases are disproportionately occurring in agricultural and farm work, a little bit more in services and sales, construction related trades, manufacturing, food and beverage production, cleaning janitorial environmental services, landscaping outdoor maintenance exclusively Latinx here, sanitation public transportation, caregiver, and personal help. You can see in the non-Latino Hispanic group, the majority are not working, self-described, or, or other or professional managerial public safety and education. Now I'm gonna to move to our balance measures of overdose and suicide deaths. We still uh, tracking this very closely, looking at the three-year average, 2017 to 19 compared with this year, 2020, and you can see that um, since shelter in place was implemented in March, it, there was a trend to heightened overdose deaths in March and April, but have fallen below average levels in May and June. Suicide deaths have been occurring less frequently than average since March 2020. Again, it's very small numbers, and so it's hard to um, come up with a lot of conclusions from this. If you look at the warm line, when we advertise the warm line, we have a lot more calls and we are planning on adver advertising the warm line again. We have had a pretty much average number of calls around seven, uh, six or seven in the past month. And the top five reasons for calls are anxiety, resource needs, loneliness, overwhelmed state or other. And we will continue to adver advertise the warm line that's available to anybody in both English and Spanish and with a, a mental health professional on the other a line to that you can speak to directly. Since we have opened day carers, the decrease in child abuse and neglect allegations has, uh, has stopped. In other words, we are seeing uh, a, the, a more reporting of these uh, allegations, uh, which is good since children have been back in uh, daycare and, and congregate settings. Coming soon on the dashboard, you will see the expanded demographics that I've shown, cases by zip code, additional age categories, and trends in cases over time by age, 
and race ethnicity, expanded information on the source of transmission, expanded clinical information that I've presented today, expanded testing information that we have also presented, and, and uh, concurrent trends in community, physical, mental, and economic health, uh, some of which I've shown today. So in conclusion, transmission is occurring across all sectors and all age groups and all categories across geographies, age groups, work sites, communities, and household settings. We're seeing outbreaks in all these areas. An individual does not need to be symptomatic to transmit COVID. We have many instances where we've had asymptomatic trend, transmission from asymptomatic individuals, not just that we're picking up cases in asymptomatic, but actual transmission from asymptomatic individuals to others in households. Um, and we know we can come to the conclusion gatherings, small, large, any size are contributing to spread. So our recommendation is at all costs to avoid gatherings um, and wear facial coverings and social distancing, distance even around familiar friends and extended family, people that you don't live with regularly, you must be careful with. And again, gatherings came across loud and clear as a big problem that's leading to our cases. So uh, the other recommendation is to wear facial coverings when ride sharing in, um, or in any enclosed space with non-household members. That would include indoors at any um, grocery stores, pharmacies, healthcare facilities, et cetera. And then when ride sharing in a car or van with non-household members. So I think I'll stop there and stop sharing my screen. Thank you.